Coming up on Tech News Weekly, Jason Howell and I have got quite the show for you. First, we talk to Reed Albergati of the Washington Post about Epic Games versus Apple. Yes, the case has gone to trial. This is uh, all about how Apple's App Store could be affected in the future, how antitrust concerns in tech could be affected, plus so much more. It's a really interesting uh, interview. Then... We talk about Google enabling two-factor authentication for everyone. Will we finally get rid of passwords? Is this the start on World Password Day? Perhaps. We'll see. Then Alex Kantrowitz of the Big Technology Podcast comes on the show to talk about Signal and Facebook. Uh, Signal says it tried to run some ads on Facebook that Facebook rejected, but uh, there's some suspicion if that's actually the case. Regardless, they are very interesting ads that talk about privacy, and you should definitely see those and hear our conversation there. And then Amazon delivery drivers are back in the news. Uh, It's not for urinating in bottles this time, but for unsafe driving. Stay tuned to Tech News Weekly. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is is Twit. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 182, recorded Thursday, May 6th, 2021. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Manscaped. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. Get 20% off and free shipping by going to manscaped.com slash twit. And by ZipRecruiter. Hiring can feel like trying to find a needle in a haystack. But when you post a job on ZipRecruiter, their matching technology finds qualified candidates for you and invites them to apply. So while others give too many options, ZipRecruiter makes it simple. Try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash TNW. Hello and welcome to Tech News Weekly, the show where every week we talk to and about the people making and breaking the tech news. I am one of your hosts, Micah Sargent. And I'm the other one, Jason Howell. Before the show, we were talking about slicing uh, fruits and vegetables and hopefully not cutting off fingers, which it sounds like Micah did right before the show. Now, well, at least your finger's still attached. It is still there. Yes. I have not, uh, not lost the whole thing. Just, uh, just a piece of me, just a piece of me. Oh, well, the rest of you is here and I'm happy for that. (laughs) (laughs) Me too. Um, we have a great show planned for you today. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. And, uh, our first piece is, uh, it's an ongoing saga, uh, a seeming, seemingly never ending story, if you will. And, uh, it's about Epic And it's about Apple, and it's about an ongoing trial that continues to bring out some more information about these companies. Uh, Joining us today is Reed Albergati from the Washington Post to talk about their coverage of the Epic Games versus Apple trial and uh, what we've learned about how Fortnite works and kind of what it wants out uh, out of this court case. Welcome to the show, Reed. Thank you for having me. Yes, we are happy to have you here. So let's kick things off. Um, maybe for, for folks who could be tuning in for the first time or are kind of uh, out of date on the Epic versus Apple trial, could you explain kind of why this court case exists, what uh, what the, the two sides kind of hope to gain uh, from going to trial and what's going on here? Sure thing. I mean, a lot of your viewers probably remember last August when... Fortnite, which Epic owns, uh, I think the most popular video game in the world, started offering its users on iOS a different way to pay for those micropayments in the game um, and bypassed Apple's 30% cut, Apple's payment system. Apple then took Fortnite off the App Store and then Fortnite immediately sued with the 60-page lawsuit. It also came with a big public relations campaign. They had a a uh, movie, sort of a short film that compared Apple to Big Brother in 1984. Um, it was called 1980 Fortnite, I think it was. Um, ironic because, you know, Apple's uh, famous Super Bowl commercial, which compared IBM to Big Brother. Uh, so it sort of harkened back to that. Uh, and this lawsuit has been, you know, ongoing. There's been discovery over the past year and it went to trial on Monday. Uh, so we've, you know, seen. Epic CEO 
uh, Tim Sweeney on the stand. We'll see the other Tim, Tim Cook, uh, probably toward the end of the trial. And uh, what this case really is about, uh, Epic accuses Apple of being a monopoly, of essentially controlling iOS, which they say, which Epic says is an industry unto itself, and then abusing its power by forcing app developers to use Apple's, you know, both their distribution, the App Store, and their payment processing system, um, IAP and app purchases. Um, and they say that is a violation of antitrust law because they are tying two products together, which you're not allowed to do if you're, if you're a monopoly. Gotcha. Yes. Uh, thank you for that. That little bit of a summary. Um, it is, it is, it gets more complex. It seems every single, uh, time, you know, as we, as both sides kind of figure out what they're after, uh, in, in this case, but, um, Epic Games, of course, you know, has tried different methods of uh, of of getting what it hopes to get out of this through different means. The you know in the United or in the EU and and through different antitrust con- concerns and complaints, and uh, it's kind of an approach from all sides. Um, and this case has has finally you know kicked off and. There are, as the the Washington Post own piece shows, uh, maybe John, you could pull that up. Just boxes and boxes and boxes of exhibits uh, that are are available for the the case, and of course that means that information is uh, getting out there about these different things. Um, we've learned a lot about Apple and the the argument being made against it, um, but. Fortnite and Epic Games itself has a lot of information. So um, why don't you share just some some of the juicy details, if you will, about what we've learned uh, regarding Epic Games uh, due to this this ongoing trial? I think, yes, in, in, in discovery over the past year, as these companies, both of their gigantic legal teams have just been receiving millions of documents and uh, parsing through them, probably using an army of both, you know, software and uh, interns. Uh, they they pulled up some interesting documents. We've learned about Epic's financials. Uh, in fact, they you know have been losing a lot of money on on their own app store. Um, you know, they're they're willing to. It's it's clear that Epic is is willing to lose money to try to you know break into this market. But I I kind of want to pull back here and say, um, you know, as interesting as it is, uh, from, you know, the, uh, especially for video game, a video game audience to see Epic's financials, um, and, and some of Microsoft's as well. Microsoft said yesterday that they're, they, you know, Epic earns them, I think seven or $800 million uh, a year, um, through, you know, through these in-app purchases, um, it's interesting, but it's also not really central to the case. Um, mm-hmm. Epic itself, it's, it's not, it's not actually very important or it shouldn't be, um, in a case that ultimately is about defining the market for iOS. So the big question here is, uh, has nothing to do with Epic. It has to do with, you know, what does iOS actually compete with? Uh, some people might think, iOS competes with Android. In the U.S., there's a they have about a 50% 50-50 split. Google and Apple in the smartphone handset market, um, just in terms of the number of units. Uh, but Apple is actually saying, you know, because Epic's bringing the suit, what we should really be looking at here is the video game market. So, you know, Epic is you know Fortnite is a video game, so you can play that on Xbox, you can play that on PlayStation. Um, so they've been trying to kind of narrow the argument there. And so the big question is, is how, how is the judge going to view that? Um, you know, I, I tend to think of smart, the smartphone market as, as Android and iOS. Um, I've never once thought, well, I'm going to get rid of my iPhone. I'm going to buy an Xbox instead. I just, just don't see those as, as the same thing. Um, but I, there's, there's another question here, which is customer lock-in. So even though there's a 50-50 split, if Epic can show that customers are really locked into iOS and that Apple does a lot to try to keep those customers locked in to make it very difficult for them to switch over to Android. They have a better shot at winning this argument in court that iOS is is the market we should be looking at. So those are the things that I'm interested in this case. Um, 
but it, it's not as juicy as uh, you're right as looking at Epic's financials, for instance. Well, then, yeah. Let, I mean, let's let's go down that route because <clears throat> Epic uh, Games and Spotify are two of the kind of loudest voices here, um, and this does become more of a conversation about uh, Apple's App Store. So, do you think that that this trial um, has the potential to make a change for the App Store? Um, or is Epic Games so focused on what it singularly wants out of this trial mm -hmm. that it will kind of uh, sort of pigeonhole the, the potential results of it? In, in other words, are we going to see a larger change take place because of this trial? Or is it really just Apple and Epic Games here and one or the other side wins? Do you, do you feel? I, yeah, I mean, I think that's a good question and a good point um, to bring up. I mean, there's a lot of ifs there. So uh, if Epic is successful in what they are asking for in this trial, it's going to affect the entire iOS ecosystem. It's going to have a big impact on a lot of companies, um, Spotify included, but also independent developers who right now, um, you know, if you want to start an app on iOS, you have to go through Apple's, you know, distribution system, which kind of limits your, there's a lot of rules on the app store about, about which, you know, APIs you can use. You also have to use their payment system, which, you know, maybe when you're first starting out is only 15%. Apple recently made that change. If you make under a million dollars in revenue, it's only a 15% cut. But as soon as you make a million, that goes up to 30%. So, you know, you, you have kind of a ceiling there on your business. Your business model has to has to be able to support, you know, 30% of your revenue going, going to Apple. So that could change too. The judge could say, um, you know what, you have to, Apple, you have to allow competing payment processing systems on the app store. And, um, you know, with more competition, it's almost a certainty that those commissions would go down, go way down. Um, they, the judge could also say, you know, the app store cannot be the only, you know, you can't, you can't force people to distribute through the app store. That would open up the potential for other app stores, for other ways of, of app distribution. Um, so you could see, you know, theoretically, more innovation, more creative ideas on, on iOS. If you talk to venture capitalists in, in Silicon Valley right now, they'll say, well, I'm not going to fund a startup that's just based on iOS because there's, you know, everything's already been created that can be created on, on iOS. There's no, there's no point. There's no upside to that. That business, iOS has to be sort of an afterthought. So mm -hmm. I think you could see more, more innovation. So even though Epic may be doing this for completely selfish reasons, um, for its own bottom line, the outcome of the case is absolutely uh, broad. That said, it'll definitely be appealed, could go to the Supreme Court. You could see the, you know, Epic lose the case and potentially see the Department of Justice bring a lawsuit uh, on behalf of all developers or all consumers. So I wouldn't say it's going to be over which way it goes, it's not going to be over after this trial. And how, I, guess, I think the last question I'll ask you here is, um, how does this impact or sort of um, fall in line with the, I think it was a recent EU ruling about uh, Apple and antitrust, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, let me look here. Uh, yeah, an antitrust charge six days ago. Um uh, from the European Commission, uh, do, is this kind of will that provide more evidence for this trial that Epic is is putting forth, or uh, will the outcome of the uh, trial help to impact what the EU has suggested uh, about the App Store? Kind of do these things work in concert, or um, can one rely on the other for for more proof? Well, this, the EU recently ruled in a preliminary finding that Apple has been manipulating the, uh, the, the music streaming business to its advantage, um, essentially using its monopoly power over iOS to, to do that. So the EU, so they've, they've said, actually, Apple, that iOS is a market and Apple does have a monopoly over that market. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a big deal. It's also subject to a lot more 
you know, appeal and, and fighting. And we don't exactly know how that's going to turn out. Mm. Uh, of course, EU antitrust laws are very different from U.S. antitrust laws. They're they're much stricter. They also, you know, haven't actually done much as <laughs> obviously to, to reel in these companies. Right. So uh, so the U.S. is now sort of taking a crack at it. We have lawsuits against both Facebook and Google uh, here. I think the bigger deal in Europe, uh, maybe there's there's new legislation that is, you know, propo- proposed. We haven't seen it. You know, we don't know exactly how it's going to turn out. But the proposal is that, uh, you know, Apple will have to, will be forced to open up some of its systems. And I think the question there is, you know, if if that legislation is passed, does that only affect the European market, or does or does Apple just change because? You know, it's hard to sort of bifurcate your customer base geographically, you know, between Europe and the U.S. So I do, I do think that's a big deal. Um, but you know, this le- legislative process can take a long time. So if that answers your question, but if, yeah, absolutely. This trial of the evidence is already in. Um, there's no, there's not, there's not going to be any new evidence entered into into the current Epic trial that comes out, you know, in that in that EU case. Right, right. Well, uh, Reid Albergati, I want to thank you so much for joining us today and for uh, talking about this story with us. Of course, folks should head to the Washington Post uh, to check out all the great coverage there, including the coverage on Epic Games versus uh, Apple and the ongoing saga. But if folks want to follow you online and check out the great work you're doing, where do they go to do so? Uh, I do post uh, pretty much all the stories on Twitter, uh, just at my name, my full name, um, or uh, you know, go go to the Washington Post and you know search my name there. You can see everything I've I've been doing. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Reed. All right. Uh, coming up, we're going to do some uh, some story of the week uh, action. Google has big plans for two factor authentication. Actually, pretty interesting plans. And we're going to talk about that. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Manscaped. There's actually a little bit of news, even even though this is, of course, an ad read. But there's actually some news uh, with Manscaped, manscaped manscaped.com. The uh, Manscaped engineering team uh, just successfully created and launched the Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer. It's now available for purchase in the U.S. and Canada. And when I say breaking news, I mean they announced this publicly this morning, <laughs> it was just cool. just minutes, ago, just moments ago that they released uh, the Lawnmower uh, 4.0. I actually have it uh, right here as well. Uh, we were we were one of the first to get our hands on it and to be able to share the news. So that's what we have here. Uh, Manscaped products are awesome, by the way. Um, so you got to check it out. Uh, join over two million men worldwide who trust Manscaped, and we have an exclusive offer for you: twenty percent off as well as free shipping when you go to manscaped.com slash twit. Um, Like I said, you know, we were were some of the first people to get the new 4.0. It is awesome. I mean, their products are always awesome, but it's got an advanced ceramic blade, skin safe technology. Um, (laughs) So good, in fact, that, you know, you might wonder, was was Elon Musk in on the engineering of this product? (laughs) He was not at least not to my knowledge, but you might wonder that. Um, And (laughs) honestly, um, you know, when it comes to grooming and trimming, especially trimming down there, you really need the right tool for the job. Uh, I know for myself, it's a job that I (laughs) simply do not want to get wrong. So grooming accidents, they're no fun. So take it seriously. I'm taking it seriously with the lawnmower 4.0. It allows me to do that. So what actually makes the trimmer different from other trimmers? You have a new multifunction on-off switch that you can engage a travel lock that's created for people who like to travel so it's not suddenly buzzing in your suitcase. The lawnmower 4.0 gives you the ability to turn the 4000K LED spotlight on and off when needed on the previous model it turned on you know uh just just when you were operating uh now you kind of have more control 
And the new trimmer even allows for a customized trim all over through additional guard lengths with sizes one through four. So you're not locked into just like a super close trim and then a single uh, distance trim. Now you have four different uh, distances to choose from. And looks wise, it's, I mean, it's very different. It's a two-tone matte and gloss finish, even features a hot foil stamped black chrome manscaped logo. So there's no denying where you got it. Uh, the optimized lawnmower 4.0 trimmer is waterproof, of course, so you can groom in the shower and not have to worry about making a mess in the bathroom floor. I have, you know, I have no qualms of leaving it in the shower. It gets wet and it doesn't matter. It's, it's made to withstand the shower. And of course, wireless charging. The Lawnmower 4.0's new wireless charging system uses electromagnetic induction, which can help the battery length uh, last longer. Pretty awesome stuff. So if you're still trimming your face with your down there trimmer, that's how I like to call it anyways, uh, <laughs> it is time to make some changes and <laughs> you can thank me later for it. Get 20% off and free shipping by going to manscaped.com slash twit. That's 20% off and free shipping by going to manscaped.com slash twit. And you can unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job. That's the most important part right there. And you're going to get that tool with Manscaped. Thank you so much for supporting this show, Manscaped. And uh, everybody check it out, manscaped.com slash twit. All right, so my story of the week this week, and then we're going to have another interview here in a, in a little bit, but my story of the week uh, was brought to my attention by you, Micah, leading up to this show, and I'm really intrigued by this. Apparently, first of all, uh, today is World Password Day. Every day well, has a day to it. I had no idea. Happy Did World you know Password that? Day. Yeah. Hey, I hey you know, know what, that. passwords? You are great. You're you've been neat. You've been great <laughs> security tools. But um, kind of feeling like, you know, more and more people are thinking maybe there's a better way, but there's a better solution. I know I have two-factor authentication activated on my most important accounts, Google being one of them. And Google is using this day to spread the message that everybody get on the two-factor authentication train. Um, choo -choo. They're going to be so. First of all, they're going to be prompting everybody to activate, which is okay, great, you know, fine. You get a you get a little message on your phone that says, "Hey, turn on two-factor authentication. Here's why it's awesome. Here's why you need it, and everything." That's step one. Eventually, they're going to be Google's going to be requiring its users with smartphones uh, tied to their accounts to use two-factor authentication, or at least they're going to opt them in, which I think is a really big step. Um, it's going to automatically enroll users if their accounts are set up properly, meaning that they have a smartphone that's that's tied to the account that has a verified number, that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm really curious about this because no question pass passwords are, are super flawed security tools. They've been around forever. They've served a purpose, but even Google says 66% of Americans admit to using the same password across multiple sites. <clears throat> I, I definitely <laughs> fall at least partially into that camp. I'm better now oh. than I ever have been, but there, okay. there are a couple of sites, you know, I've, I've done a lot of remediation, but have I got everything? I don't know. That's the thing. I've signed up for a million different sites. I don't know. I'm sure there's a few out there. Two-factor authentication is inherently much more secure Microsoft reported that 99.9% .9 of its compromised accounts were not protected by two-factor authentication. So that says something about 2FA right there. Um, but what I'm curious about is, is forcing users to use it poses its own problems, right? Like security is enhanced, of course, but locking some oneself out of their account uh, is because of the two-factor authentication basically risks losing everything that's associated with that account. And believe me, I should know, I did it live on This Week in Google one time by accident. <laughs> um, if everyone is opted in, I have to imagine that the percentage of people accidentally getting locked out of their accounts and maybe never finding their way back in increases. That's going to pose a big challenge and a big risk for a lot of users. What do you think about that, Micah? Yeah, this is... Um Overall, I think this is a really good thing um, for, for multiple reasons. One, uh, if you're opted in, it's sort of a pulling off the band-aid bandage kind of situation where yeah. you 
you try it here and then you get used to two-factor authentication. And then because you are used to two-factor authentication, you start to use it in other places. It becomes more familiar. You, totally. you know, it's suddenly not this kind of, I don't understand what that means. I don't know how to use it. Uh, so I like that because I think that it could result in more people uh, enabling or uh, having their family enable for them two-factor authentication on their other accounts. And of course, more security overall is, is so much better than, than less security. But I do agree with you that um, there is a concern that you would end up getting locked out of, account, out of an account and that that would be the end of it uh, for the rest of time. And that is... That is not good. <laughs> uh, no. That is that is very bad. That is you know especially if your email that you are logging into is the email that you use on different sites, which are used to uh, forgot password, which are used for the forgot password mechanism. Suddenly, mm. you could be locked out of a um, you know a, a bunch of different sites that you uh, have signed up for if you forget the password there, and then you can't get back into the email address that's associated with it. So there's that part of it. And then if we consider all of that, we suddenly have to think about the social engineering uh, aspect of things where suddenly uh, banks and, and uh, I don't know, even just social media accounts and whatnot uh, get real legitimate uh, messages, support messages saying, hey, I got locked out of my Gmail account. I'm trying to do the forgot password thing, but I can't get access to my email and I need to get access to my Facebook, um, can you help me? And they help that person. Uh, you know, Again, I don't mm -hmm. know exactly what the mechanisms are for each individual site. Some of them might just say, no, sorry, we can't. But you know, let's say that some do help and they do get access. But then if there's an influx of true and valid uh, versions, then there are also going to be bad actors who will also take advantage of that and say, oh, I got locked out of my Gmail because you know, two-factor authentication got enabled. Ultimately, the security and safety of 2FA is more important than any of the, the potential side effects, I feel. Um, and I think that as we continue to try to find a passwordless um, future, that, yeah. that you know, folks have to get used to this. But yeah, there are going to be some bumps in in between. And it'll be interesting to see how they try to handle that in the meantime, if there are going to be multiple forms of authentication available to folks in the, the immediate opt-in, I mean, because, um, you know, you typically a company will start by using the phone number as the 2FA method. And then you can go in on your own and say, no, I want to use an app for my 2FA method. And then also some sites will allow you to do a hardware key um, as your you know, second form of authentication. So that'll be interesting to see when that gets enabled, what exactly that means by default. Yeah. And I mean, Google has actually really good uh, 2FA options, right? Like, yes, you can do the the SMS uh, version, which is probably the, the one you should opt not to do if you have the opportunity to do it. Because yes. there are ways to, you know, uh, sim hijack SIMs and, and be able to get into your accounts, even if you're using SMS as two-factor. Um, yes, you can use an app to authenticate. But on my Google account, I haven't used an app or SMS in, I don't know, a year and a half now, because Google also has tied into Android phones. If you're logged into your um, Google account on there, this automatic like pop-up thing that it recognizes. So if I go to Google and I type in my name and then I type in my password and I unlock my phone, the second I unlock my phone, I've got this screen that says, hey, this person is logging in. Is that you? And so mm -hmm. it's it's basically the same thing as using the code, but without having to go into the app to pick the code, copy it, go back over, paste it in, I just say yes, and boom, I've got access to my account. It's really handy. And iOS users who download the Google app can also use that uh, as well. I It'll pop yeah. up a notification on my phone and say, hey, uh, looks like somebody's trying to log in. Is this you? And so occasionally I'll have to do that with uh, Gmail. And just on my iPhone, I hit yes. Occasionally, if there's suspicion, uh, when the login happens, it will show you a number. And so say the number is 44. Then on the phone... Yeah you choose, you know, they'll, they'll show you three numbers and say, what is the number that is on the screen? You tap 44 and then it logs you in. So yeah, those are, um, those are both good. I think for, um, 
the convenience. My concern there is a universal form of 2FA, which is, you know, anybody can get either a free app or a paid app. Um, I personally use one password as their uh, 2FA generator. And Mm -hmm. that's universal, meaning that I don't have to go to each individual app because Adobe recently started doing this too. Uh, When you log in to Adobe, then it will pop up. um, It's actually a separate app, not even just one of the apps that already exists. It's a Adobe Authenticator or something like that. And it will pop up and say, hey, is this you logging in? So now I'm suddenly having to download apps for every single thing. And that is annoying. I don't don't quite like that. So I'm... I really like the hardware key. I like the uh, two-factor authentication code, but I think they call it OT, OTP, one-time password code, and uh, those methods. Certainly, yes, if you can help it, don't do SMS. But again, for folks who aren't versed in this, they might it's not It's better know than that. nothing. Yeah, yeah I, they well, might then not that's know true, that, true. and that's it's better true. than true. nothing. Yeah, yep. it's better than not using it. Um, yeah, and real quick before we round this out, um, uh, speaking of Microsoft on Windows 10, I didn't realize this. I read a post by Paul Thorat on this you know, news today. He mentioned that two-factor authentication on Windows 10 means that all a user needs in order to sign into a Windows 10 PC is their email address and the Authenticator app on their phone. It, it basically eliminates the need for the password altogether. With Google, like I said, you still need your ID, you need your password, and then you do your two-factor. And yeah, do what, do what Microsoft's doing. If we can eliminate the password and just rely entirely on the two-factor and eliminate a step then you're replacing one security speed bump with another one, but an inherently more secure one and not much more trouble, you know, in, 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 in fact, maybe even less trouble because you're not managing a bunch of passwords or using a password manager as a separate layer and all this kind of stuff. So whatever Microsoft's doing, do that, Google and, and others, because that seems like a really uh, great approach. Simplify it, even if it is secure, um, you know, super secure. So, Yeah. Cool stuff. Yeah. Very cool. All righty. Um, let's see. Oh, <laughs> I think I got lost to the sauce there. Um, <laughs> Uh, up next, Signal, the messaging service, took out some ads on Facebook. Facebook didn't like them. So we will see some of those ads and talk about why Facebook rejected them here in a moment. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Zip Recruiter. If you're a business owner who's hiring, you probably face a lot of challenges when it comes to finding the right person for your role. That's where Zip Recruiter comes into play. Whether it's not enough applicants with the right skills or experience, too many resumes to sort through, yet you need to hire ASAP, or not knowing where to post your job to reach the right people, well, those are all reasons why hiring can feel like trying to find a needle in a haystack, and sometimes a needle in a haystack made of needles. Sure, you can post your job to some job board, but then all you can do is hope the right person comes along, which is why you should try ZipRecruiter for free at ziprecruiter.com slash TNW. When you post a job on ZipRecruiter, their matching technology finds people with the right experience for your job and actively invites them to apply. In fact, ZipRecruiter is so effective that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first dadgum day. That's right, in the first day of posting. It's no wonder over 2.3 million businesses have come to ZipRecruiter for their hiring needs. So while the other companies overwhelm you with way too many options, ZipRecruiter finds you the needle in the haystack. And right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free at ziprecruiter.com slash T-N-W. That's ziprecruiter.com slash T-N-W. Thanks so much to ZipRecruiter for sponsoring this week's episode of Tech News Weekly. We appreciate you. All righty. So it's a kerfuffle time. As far as kerfuffles (laughs) go, the Signal and Facebook uh, ad kerfuffle is a fascinating one. Uh, I rate kerfuffles in my spare time. So this is right up there. Uh, 
a lot to learn from. I don't even know what kerfuffle actually means. I should probably look up the definition. Uh, there's a lot to learn from this. Uh, so we brought in Alex Kantrowitz from the Big Technology Podcast to help us break it down. Welcome back to the show, Alex. Great to be back. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. It's always my pleasure and our pleasure to have you on the network. Thank you. So um, first of all, I, I came across your, your Twitter thread, so uh, I could I could tell you were charged up about this, and we'll talk all, all, all about it. But start by explaining a little bit what Signal did exactly here. What kind of ads uh, were they seeking to run? I think it was on Instagram. It wasn't on Facebook, right? It was on Instagram. Yeah. Um, so Signal basically wanted to run these ads that pointed out what Facebook's targeting looked like to you. So they would be like, you're getting this ad because, you know, you're a GP with a master's in history and you're divorced uh, and you're in London. And um, they wanted to make a bunch of different type of ads that were going to tell people exactly how Facebook is targeting them to basically say, if you don't like the fact that you're using a service that targets you this way, maybe try Signal. Uh, and so that's sort of what the ads look like. They're actually great ads. Yeah, I got to say, they're kind of brilliant. Like, I'm, I'm surprised to have not seen an ad uh, like this before because, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't I don't work in the ad industry, so I don't know firsthand what it what, it, you know, what it takes to, to do, set something like this up. But I have to imagine on the ad campaign side of things, when you're creating something, you are receiving kind of this uh, the benefits of the data that the network is collecting on on people. And apparently you have access to some sort of that fire hose in order to basically reflect that back to the user. Like, I guess I didn't I didn't realize that was the case. I would have expected that signal would have access to the ability to target, but not necessarily know that kind of granular detail about some. Well, are they actual ads or were they mock ups? Are you do you know that? Well, that's the big question. Because Signal says that it tried to run the ads, and Facebook said that they never actually set them to run. Um, so that's where their debate is uh, basically taking place. Signal's like, dude, it does this whole big blog post, and the ads are so great that, you know, it's like one of those rejected Super Bowl ads. Sometimes you get yeah. more attention for the stuff that doesn't make it in than the stuff that totally. actually does. And brands will create ads they know are going to get rejected from the Super Bowl uh, because there's going to be more publicity around it uh, than if they actually make it into the game. And they don't have to spend the $4 million. And so uh, that's sort of what it seems like uh, with Signal in this case. Signal said they tried to run the ads, but, um, you know, they put evidence up, but it didn't exactly show what they were trying to get get uh, get across. Yeah, yeah. And I've also seen um, seen some mentions of of these screenshots being from a date. I think they're, you know, like early March or something. In March, and yeah. Yeah, the yes. screenshot that, that Signal's using to prove that its ads were rejected is from March. Well, last time I checked, we're in May. Uh, and right. so, you know, if uh, and, and also the, the screenshot doesn't show any ads rejected. Um, so I don't know. I mean, did they wait a month and a half to put this blog post up? That seems <laughs> unlikely. Did they show an outdated screenshot? Maybe. But why not just show the screenshot that actually has the rejected ads? I have an idea why why they might not have done it. It's probably it was a stunt. So, yeah, I mean, it kind of kind of feels like. Yeah, I, I think it, I, your comparison to like the Super Bowl ads and, you know, sometimes getting more more attention because they aren't run uh, is, I think, perfectly uh, apt. At the same time, I completely appreciate the 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 kind of exercise here, the 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 reason for the ad, what Signal is doing here calls to light something very important that, you know, it, it's a great visualization about the type of detailed granular information that can be gleaned about a particular user uh, by using these social networks in the ways that we do. And so, like, on one hand, it feels like a stunt and like, OK, well, yeah, I guess I'm not surprised that that Facebook would, you know, shut this down. On the other hand, I kind of want to see it go because uh, because it's kind of brilliant. <laughs> yeah, no, I think the ads are great. Um, if Signal, you know, Signal is pretty adamant that it tried to run them uh but we haven't yeah. seen the proof yet. And Facebook even says that it would allow some of these to run, but Signal's account was down because of a payment issue in March. Oh, so wow. what I would really like to see is some of these ads actually show up on Facebook getting targeted in the way that Signal says they can be targeted. You know, that would be cool. I think seeing the message is one thing. I think it's nice. 
Um, but if there if there's a chance that Signal is kind of like just doing this as, you know, a stunt and flubbing the truth a little bit so it can get these ads in front of more people, uh, that doesn't make me feel great about about them. Like mm -hmm. it, they don't you know, you don't really need to stretch the truth in this situation right. to show right. how creepy Facebook advertising can be. Um, but that said, look, we're, we're talking about it here. We've been people have been talking about it all week. I know the story because, um, you know, this tweet storm that I did uh, that wasn't even started as a tweet storm. But like both companies start sending me messages. Um, it's been picked up and, uh, you know, across the world. It's showing up in India and elsewhere. Um, and yeah. so people are definitely paying attention. So obviously a win for Signal on the marketing front. Um, I'm just I still have some questions about the integrity of the campaign, but uh, it doesn't seem like they care very much. Yeah, right, right. Now, is there anything, um, any any indication in Facebook's or Instagram's kind of terms for, you know, the people who would advertise on their network uh, preventing someone like Signal from doing exactly this? Um, or is this, is this some sort of a loophole that Facebook immediately recognized like, oh, wait a minute, the, you know, it can be used like that. We didn't realize it. I'd be surprised if that was the case. But do they explicitly yeah. prohibit this sort of surfacing of that information? Parts of it. I mean, they do show lots of different details in these ads. So um, Facebook says stuff like a medical condition, for instance, wouldn't be allowed. So if mm. you have that in there, then potentially, you know, it would have to ban the ads. But actually, Facebook says some of the ads would get through if Signal did try to run them. Uh, assuming we take Facebook at its word, which is always a risky proposition. Um, <laughs> there had been some discussion that like, oh, well, you can't have an ad that's all filled with text. Uh, but that act, that rule apparently has gone away. So a text heavy ad is a OK. Um, and, you know, it's just a question of like what they're actually surfacing in terms of the targeting criteria. Uh, but long story short, some of these ads are fine. Uh, so I think Signal should give it another shot. Maybe pay their yeah. bill. Yeah, <laughs> agreed, agreed. Um, is there anything particularly dangerous about some of this information? Like like when I see an ad that's surfacing this, like I guess it's it's reflecting back to me my own personally mm -hmm. identifiable information. Well, I mean, it's not specific to my name if I were seeing these ads, but it's it's seemingly giving me a lot of personal information about myself, let's say. Is there anything dangerous about that, about that being reflected in an ad such as this? Yeah, I would say for the vast majority of people, you know, nearly everyone, there isn't a um, real risk in having all this information available uh, about you online through the online advertising systems. Um, you know, a lot of time people have that this like main character complex, right, where they're like, oh, Facebook knows that I, I have a master's like this, you know, it right. just doesn't really matter in the in the scheme of things. But there are lots of cases in, advertise, in the advertising world where there is too much data available on people. Uh, one of the cases that I've been interested in is uh, I think U.S. special ops <laughs> have had their uh, locations exposed because of ad data or device data that's gone tracked and become available in the um, ad exchanges. And it's like, you know, you could do everything you want, but if you carry your phone and you open up Facebook or you open up, you know, some other website, then all of a sudden your location's exposed and your operation is compromised. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there are definitely a handful of, of different uh, places where it could actually put people's safety at risk. Not I, I wouldn't say, you know, most cases, but there are those cases. But, uh, you know, overall, I think we all feel, um, you know, kind of queasy about the fact that advertising has been able to target us this granularly. And I think it's fairly unnecessary. Like uh, advertising for a long time has been done on reach and frequency. Uh, and advertisers are quite happy about that. And even, you know, people talking about the Apple cookie or sort of the Apple, uh, you know, uh, forcing people to opt in to tracking when they're using Facebook. Advertisers are like, fine, I'll just find another way to advertise without all this, you know, creepy tracking. And it's like, come on, guys, you could have done this the whole time. And now yeah. you're only doing it because Apple is forcing the issue. So advertising adjusts. I think that um, we're in an era where they've collected all the data just because they can. But I do hope we get out of it at some at some point because it's unnecessary. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Now, uh, finally, I did notice on your Twitter thread uh, after Facebook and Signal representatives were going back and forth, uh, you posed the opportunity to both of them to come on your podcast and talk about it. Have they taken you up on that by chance or is that something you want to talk That's about? That's right. Well, look, I, you know, one of the things I do on my show is I try to have people with differing opinions come together and duke it out. Um, it's yeah. amazing 
you know, on Twitter, we just go back and forth and yell at each other without any context. And it's a performative dunk fest. And I'm like, totally. well, what if we actually, you know, saw each other face to face? So we've had like Kevin Ruse from the New York Times debate, Mark Ledwich, who's a software engineer who basically said his reporting on YouTube radicalization was BS. And instead of like, you know, vitriol on Twitter, they talked it out and I think they got to a good resolution. So the offer's open to Facebook and Signal. Um, I, I heard back from one of the parties that they would consider it. Uh, I'm not too optimistic because uh, I think the the tenor uh, of our conversations of our discourse today are largely, uh, you know, pretty vitriolic and people seem to revel in the fighting. Uh, mm. But but I will press the issue, and I do hope that we can get both of those companies on to talk about uh, to talk about their businesses and talk about what differentiates them. They both have good arguments, and uh, and I, you know I, I, maybe I'm too idealistic, but I think a world where we can start talking to each other versus yelling at each other is something we should aspire to, uh, and I'll keep pressing for that. Absolutely agree, and appreciate that you do. Uh, Big technology podcast is a podcast where you may or may not hear that discussion. Even if you don't hear that discussion, you'll hear lots of very uh, interesting discussion nonetheless. Uh, Alex Kantrowitz, uh, always appreciate you coming on the show. People want to follow you online. Where can they find you? Yep. So you could get Big Technology Podcast on any app uh, that you use for podcasting. Just added TuneIn, which I think was the last of the bunch. So you just type in Big nice. Technology Podcast wherever uh, you get your podcasts and you'll be able to find... Uh, the conversations there. Excellent. Thank you again, Alex. Best of luck. We'll talk to Thank you soon. Thank you. All right. Looking forward to the next one. <laughs> All righty. Bye-bye. All right. And up next, Amazon drivers, they're sharing a little bit more about the struggles that they face um, while they're delivering packages for the company. Yes, uh, Amazon drivers are back in the news cycle. Of course, uh, we talked about them before on the show. Uh, Amazon drivers were complaining that because of the pressure to complete their routes, they didn't have time to use the restroom. And so many a delivery driver was reportedly urinating or reportedly urinating in water bottles and different <laughs> different containers and sometimes leaving them in the trucks. And uh, there was kind of a, a, a little bit of an observation about uh, the pressures that the different drivers are under. And of course, Amazon at first said, no, this isn't a thing that happens. And uh, then, then people came with the receipts showing, no, it's definitely a thing that happens. The latest news uh, comes from Vice. And this is about Amazon drivers being encouraged in some way to uh, recklessly drive in order to meet their quotas. So it's important to kind of understand the the sort of backbone of this story. Um, Amazon delivery drivers use an app called Mentor, which it, it runs on their phone and it uses the sensors built into the phone. If you've ever... Um, got insurance if you're like a parent and you've ever gotten insurance for your child and they offered um like a safe driving thing <laughs> a safe driving discount and they give you this little puck that you plug into your uh car that monitors how the driving is going then you might be familiar with this um it is like that except it's just built into the phone and so the phone uh, because of the app can can detect you know hard braking uh speeding etc well, um, according to several drivers uh, who are driving for uh, delivery partners, I think that's important to note too, it is companies who Amazon has hired to do their deliveries. And so these companies whose drivers are making Amazon deliveries are being told to sign out of Mentor in some cases uh, there was another quote, starting tomorrow, everyone needs to be logged into Mentor for at least two hours, no more, no less. So, so make exactly sure that, two hours. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. For precisely two hours um, instead of the whole driving time. And uh, Motherboard talked to Amazon delivery drivers in New York, in Texas, in Michigan, in Tennessee, and in Georgia. And these drivers in all of these places said that the companies they worked for ordered them to log off of the app or turn on airplane mode or shut off their phones in the middle of their shifts so that the Mentor app was unable to collect data about their driving over the past year. Now, 
they uh, the five of the drivers that they spoke to said that the mentor app was they were told to keep it on for a few hours and then turn it off. And the reason they think that is is because if they just kept it off the whole time, then Amazon would be able to kind of see that data and go, oh, you're not using the app like you should be. But if it's on for a few times, then it kind of can get lost in the data. And so they get to, to do these deliveries. So along with this, um, the drivers are being encouraged to make these driver these uh, deliveries quickly. Uh, one person said uh, speeding was the main thing. They were harsh on drivers that weren't going as fast as they wanted. I complied when they asked me to turn off the app because I didn't want to cause friction, but it was a lot of stress, high blood pressure, seething anger, and frustration. Um, and this is uh, the, uh, a spokesperson from Amazon. Sort of, this is the the reverse of this. So here, here it comes. This behavior is unacceptable and does not adhere to the safety standards that we expect of all delivery service partners. Delivery service partners are these companies that Amazon hires out to do these deliveries. It's also misleading to suggest that this behavior is necessary. In fact, more than 90% of all drivers are able to complete their deliveries before the scheduled time while following all safety procedures. So that's what Amazon says. Despite Amazon saying that, these companies very clearly are saying, hey, you may think that, but uh, we don't, um, we, we seem to have to turn off uh, the, the system or log out of the system in order to uh, make these deliveries. So there are very strict rules that Amazon sets in place, including um, with the, the app, I can detect if you're looking at your phone, for example, or if you are, like I said, heartbreaking, speeding, et cetera. And uh, Amazon delivery drivers are on average trying to deliver about 400 packages in a 10-hour shift. And so it's not uh, a surprise that uh, they're sort of inadvertently being encouraged, and in some cases, advertently being encouraged to uh, break traffic laws and other uh, rules and regulations to try and make these deliveries and on time. So yeah, it's it's another uh, it's another situation situation Jason or the two words I was trying to say together uh, to that that it's just like unfair pressure on these delivery drivers and I I don't know how we solve this. I, I'm, it's not on us to solve it independently, but what Amazon needs well, to be paying more attention or something, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, on one hand, it's not on us to solve it. On the other hand, there are as Amazon do. subscribers, yeah, we have certain, you know, this is, this is the kind of conundrum that I think I, I've heard definitely a lot on the Twit Network and that I feel for myself. I'm an, an Amazon Prime subscriber. Mm -hmm. I appreciate and am wowed, like floored when I order something on Amazon and it's delivered the next day. That's like the, the experience of that is, whoa, that was really cool. Amazon is so neat that they can pull that off, right? Uh, but this is the flip side of that, right? In in Amazon's drive, literally, to push uh, for you know faster deliveries of of their products and really be the place that its subscribers turn to in order to get basically anything. Um, in in that drive and that move to to reach that like point of excellence, this is what happens. This is the sort of thing that happens in uh, apparently in order to facilitate that. So I, as a user, as a subscriber, as a um, consumer of Amazon's uh, ecosystem and products and everything, am I choosing to support this behavior by staying a, a subscriber. And yeah, that's a, that's a hard place yeah. to be. That's a, that's a hard question for anyone to ask themselves because the other side of that is, is being real in your answer and saying, no, I don't agree with that. Okay, if you don't agree with that, then why do you support Amazon? Because yep. this is what they're doing. And yeah, it sucks to be in that position, but that's I think that's the position we're in. Yeah, I mean, I could, I, <laughs> it would completely change everything for me if I did not use Amazon. And I think that that's part of, um, that's part of the thing that really is bothersome about this is that Amazon does have such a, uh, a reach that it in some ways is able to get away with doing this because, yeah. you know, uh, even 
even if if us uh, very vocally deciding to uh, not use Amazon anymore uh, caused, you know, it's, let's say a thousand people, and that is being generous, a thousand yeah, people to stop right. using Amazon, that makes no difference. That makes no difference to Amazon's bottom line. It makes no difference to the company. I mean, Amazon has big big names, um, you know, Bernie Sanders and, uh, Elizabeth Warren and, uh, other, you know, important folks looking at it and criticizing it all the time. And yet it still is doing these things and not, um, not doing a better job to make sure that these things don't happen. And that is partially because Amazon has gotten so dadgum big and so powerful. And it's, it's frustrating um, because I do feel powerless outside of, as you say, stopping using it, which would completely right. change the way. I mean, and that's the other thing is like in the middle of a pandemic, uh, yeah. it becomes simpler to use something where I don't, you know, where I'm not making contact with anyone directly. And so I, I think that, and, and the the other thing that's to be said is, you know, I, I talked to back in the day uh, when uh, we used to go places more frequently, but even before that, um, before, you know, word of a pandemic was anywhere near, I can remember every time I would get in an Uber or a Lyft in Missouri, I would always end up talking to the driver and they would always end up talking about how uh, this this job was either a very important part of their income or uh, a, a bit of income to help support whatever they were doing. What, yeah, yeah, exactly. Supplemental income. And there were gripes and there were complaints and, you know, there were concerns with Uber and Lyft at the, at the large scale that we had heard of. But individually, you know, these people that I talked to were pleased to have this, uh, this, this ability to earn, um, some money on the side or in some cases, as I said, it was just their main source of income. And so, you know, this idea of like completely getting rid of Amazon delivery drivers or something like that, I think, uh, disregards that yeah. portion of it. Um, Absolutely. I think that, you know, these jobs should be available, but folks need to be treated properly, not, not treated as, I mean, if Amazon wants to do drones instead, then they should do drones. They shouldn't treat humans like drones. Yeah, and, that's uh, a really good point. Mm -hmm. I just, I don't, I, I don't know how this gets solved because again, a thousand person, a 1500 person boycott is not going to make Amazon change. Um, it really needs to be, I think, legislative pressure or something like that, regulatory pressure right. or something like that. So right. uh, I, I, I guess mean, you know, in, it, in that case, that's why we have to yeah. keep talking about these stories and that sure. these stories have to get out there and that I'm glad Vice is doing you know, its due diligence to make sure that uh, everybody or as many people as possible know about the ways that this is uh, not being, being done. And you know, when we are out of a pandemic... I plan to uh, be very, very uh, kind and uh, appreciative of any Amazon delivery driver that comes my way. Um, yeah, indeed. That, yeah, that's, I think everybody should try to be and try to be graceful about it. They clearly are working very hard, uh, long shifts. I think what what blows me away is you know kind of, in, and I agree with everything you just said, by the way. I, I, I don't necessarily like, believe 100% that the only way to do this is to boycott Amazon and then suddenly a bunch of people are out of work. Like that's just seems like the control that I, as a subscriber, that's the only real mm -hmm. bit of control that I have is do I give you my money or do I not? Uh, do I choose to, or do I choose not to? What's, what's, interesting to me is that very recently we had a situation where Amazon employees were in a position to potentially counter this sort of thing. And that was the whole union push. Yes. And that was largely voted down. Uh, <laughs> you know, that, that could have been the thing that applied the pressure. And outside of that, you're right. It's probably some sort of legislative 
um, pressure that that's applied to a company like Amazon, which let's be real is probably coming at some point. It really does seem like DC has big tech in its, in its crosshairs. Um, so who the heck knows what the, what the far reaching effects of it, of it will be on a company like Amazon. Uh, but I mean, ethically speaking, this is just, you know, yet another kind of uh, mark on Amazon's uh, reputation as far as how it treats its workers. And it's sad. It's, it sucks. Um, it's, it's not right. No, so, it's not. Yeah. Well, uh, I hadn't, I hadn't heard, uh, heard of that story before you brought it in. So thank you. Cause I do think that it is important that we continue to talk about those things so that hopefully at some point that, that tipping point is reached and we, uh, get to a better, better place with companies like Amazon. We'll see. Yes. Uh, we've reached the end of this episode of Tech News Weekly. Thank you so much, as always, for watching and listening. Twit.tv slash TNW is the show page on the web where you can go to subscribe to the podcast and audio, video formats, jump out to YouTube. All that stuff is listed there. Twit.tv slash TNW. And by the way, if you want all of our shows ad-free, that's right, you can get them ad-free, well, you have to check out Club Twit. It costs you seven bucks per month. And what you get is every Twitch show ad free, plus an exclusive Twit Plus feed, which has lots of cool bonus content that you're not going to get anywhere else, uh, and a members only Discord channel. Yes, a uh, Discord server. That is one of my favorite uh, parts of this. I, you know, it, maybe for some people it's about the ad free uh, podcasting, but to me, it's uh, getting to hang out with you folks in the Discord. We've got folks uh, hanging out right now, talking live in the Tech News Weekly uh, channel in the Discord. There's a general br brick house channel where everybody kind of converses and lots of different uh, bits and bops and pieces where folks are are uh, talking it up. So it's a, it's a fun place to be. And uh, for some of the shows, it could mean that you get to ask a question live on stage, so to speak, uh, audio during one of our shows. So I think that's such a fun perk. And it's one of the reasons why I've subscribed to other uh, memberships out there because I wanted to be part of the Discord and get to hang out with the folks that I, I listen to or watch. Uh, so again, that is seven bucks per month. And you can learn more about it by going to twit.tv slash club twit. Yeah, head there, check it out. It's really awesome. And uh, if you want to tweet at me or follow me on social media, I'm at Micah Sargent on pretty much all of the social media networks or as many of them as I can be. And uh, you should also check out Smart Tech Today just a little bit later today where, we'll, where we will be talking to the VP of technology at the Thread Group. And by we, I mean Matthew Casanelli and myself. Um, and Or excuse me, head of technology at the Thread Group who is the VP who is a VP at uh, Google. It's very exciting nice. stuff. We're looking forward to that. What about you, Jason? That sounds awesome. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Jason Howell. Of course, you can find me in the Discord if you're there. Uh, it is a lot of fun. I totally agree. Um, and let's see here. Other shows. Well, I was on This Week in Google yesterday. Um, Stacy Higginbotham was out, so I filled in for Stacy and had fun with Leo and Jeff and Ant. And that hasn't happened very often where I'm on the same Twig episode as Leo. So it was a lot of fun. We had a great time. Uh, so check that out, twit.tv slash TWIG for This Week in Google. Uh, big thanks to John Ashley at the studio for helping us do this show each and every week. Big thanks to Burke for uh, helping behind the scenes as well, making the show happen. And as always, thanks to you for watching and listening. We'll see you next Thursday on Tech News Weekly. Bye, everybody. Goodbye. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I am Ant Pruitt, and I want to tell you about my show, Hands on Photography, here on Twit TV. Each and every week, Thursday, that is, I like to sit down and share with you the best tips and tricks that are going to help make you a better photographer. And it's not always about Photoshop. It's not always about just having the biggest and baddest and bestest camera. It can be the simplest of things like leave your eye open when you're looking through the viewfinder. All of these simple tips can really help step your photography game up. So subscribe to the show today. That's twit.tv slash hop. And I look forward to talking to you soon.